range to define these in physics terms. Now we're going to go on to the slope and the y-intercept and discuss those things a little bit. So, uh, the slope of the line does actually have a physics meaning. So like our y-axis is position, that's a physics meaning. Our x-axis is time, that's a physics meaning. It turns out that our slope and y-intercept also have physics meanings to them. They represent physical things uh, and they describe parts of our experimental setup. So, um, in math, the M is that slope of a line. It also does have a physics meaning. In math, the slope of the line is like the steepness of your line or the tilt of your line. It's super steep, not so steep, steep the other way. It depends. But that slope is defined oftentimes as the rise of the run or the steepness or the tilt of the line. In physics, it's still going to be that steepness or that tilt, but it will tell us something about this experiment. It will tell us something about our physical setup. So uh, we'll go in and we'll take a look at the slopes that we have of this data, of all of the data, and then we'll take a look at it uh, before the ping pong ball hits the pop can and after the ping pong ball hits the pop can. We'll do a bit of all three. So uh, here's that delightful pivot data. Okay. We can see here that we have all of these data points running through. We have this nice straight line. It doesn't quite hit all of our data points. That's one of those questions early on in the analysis. Does our straight line hit all of our data points? Well, it hits some. It goes right through the guts of that one, right through the guts of that one, but we have some that it doesn't quite hit. Um, and it kind of makes sense that it's there are going to be some changes, right? There's this spot early on before it hits the cannon. Pardon me, there's a spot early on before the ball hits the pop can. There's this spot after the ball hits the pop can. So we'll do a quick little shot. Um, if we click on these things and say, hey, this is after it hit the pop can. I know it's after it hit the pop can. I think things are different then. I'm just clicking on these. It uh, subtly, faintly X's them out. Uh, we're not ignoring bad data choosing which regions we're going to analyze. We're going to analyze this region first because this is all of the spot before it hit the can. And now we'll take a look at it. Uh, holy schmoles, look at that dirt on there, y'all. Uh, straight line, right? I mean, that booger runs right through the guts of every single data point beautifully. Um, so before it hits the pop can, beautiful straight line, like a that. If we just take a look at this part after, so I click here. I bring these back and I say, you know, now I'm only interested in the part after it hits the pop can, so I will unclick these. There. Now those are all gone. Oh, look at those four there, y'all. Yeah. Oh, geez. Done. So those, again, now perfectly straight, nice and smooth right through those things. So it's doing something slightly different here than it did there. So here it's got a big steep slope. Here it's a little bit less steep, right? So uh, if we look at what we've got here, the before and after, uh, I have those things up there. So when we look at these, let's stay there for now. When we look at these before hitting the pop can, that slope was too. 0 0.030 0 e plus 4. This e plus 4 is one of the ways that it's trying to tell us that it's a big number. Uh, this e plus 4 means it's this times 10 four times. So 2.030, 0, if I say times 10, times 10, times 10, that makes it 2, uh, pardon me, 20,300 is that numerical value. Uh, the little slopey thingy here, it says the slope is 2.03. Uh, times 10 to the fourth centimeters per second. I just copied that centimeters per second right there. So before hitting the pop can, the slope was 20,300 centimeters per second. If I convert that to meters per second, that's 203 meters per second. Holy cow, like a football field 
is about a uh, hundred meters, right? A football field from end zone to end zone is pretty close to a hundred meters. So that's two football fields in one second. Now, if that ping pong ball could keep that speed, uh, air resistance training could end up slowing it down and changing things. But so this centimeters per second, meters per second, miles per hour, when we look at those units of measure, distance over time, miles per hour, meters per second, centimeters per second. They're all telling us how fast. So before hitting the pop can, 203 meters per second. After hitting that pop can, we look at the slope here. Uh, this graph shows 1.284 times 10 to the fourth. 1.284 times 10 to the fourth, or 1.284 times 10 four times. So that's times 10 once, times 10 two times, times 10 again, times 10 again, moves it over there. So that's 12,840 centimeters per second. If we can convert it to meters per second, 128.4 meters per second. That's still moving pretty dang fast, but it's a little bit slower than it was before the pop came, right? It went right through that bugger, slowed it down some, but it went right through that bugger, uh, slowed it down. So our slope here is a little bit smaller then our slope here was a bigger slope, bigger velocity, slightly smaller slope, slightly smaller velocity. So um, the slope of that graph before the pop can was steeper. It had a bigger number, a bigger velocity. The slope for that graph after it hit the pop can, less steep, a smaller number for the slope, and a smaller velocity. Now we just let the Pivot Interactive's uh, graphing software do those slope calculations for us right now. Uh, we won't worry about that for this activity. Uh, in a couple of days, we'll start doing some of those calculations ourselves, but we'll try to kind of load things up so we know what we're doing. Right now, the big thing is if we have a position versus time graph, if we have a position versus time graph, the slope of our position time graph is the velocity of the object. So this is kind of a cool, kind of a big deal, right? In math classes, we talk about calculating slopes and different sorts of things, but we don't really talk about what it means. It turns out if you have a distance time graph or a position time graph, the steepness of the line, the slope of the line, is how fast the object is going. So now we've got this math stuff, this slope stuff, but now we have a purpose to it, not just how steep is the line. Uh, another spot, right? So slope of a position graph, time graph, velocity, rise over run of a position time graph is velocity. Uh, this next chunk now, still saying all lines everywhere, all straight lines everywhere, y equals mx plus b. Um, so we've got position is velocity times time, plus our y-intercept. We still have to figure out what this y-intercept stuff represents. And so uh, you might remember from your math days uh, in math class, the y-intercept is where a graphed line is located when the x-axis is zero. That's still true in physics stuff when we're graphing things. Uh, it's just now this uh, y-intercept also might tell us something about the experiment. Um, and if we change this around, we're saying our y-axis is position. So when we say the y-intercept is where the graph line is when the x-axis is zero. Our x-axis is time. So when the time is zero, what's the position? Our y-intercept should be uh, where the ball is located when time is zero. And if we get back to that pivot lamp, see if I can that back up front. There it is. So when we bring this bugger up, and if we play this thing through, stop. as we go through this, the y-intercept, all this stuff got moved around. We have this thing down here to start with, yeah. So the y-intercept is where this object is time is set to zero. 
So we've got y equals mx plus b, the equation for every straight line everywhere. We've said our y-axis is position, the slope of the graph is velocity, our x-axis is time. We're still working on this y-intercept piece, right? So in math, the y-intercept is where the graph line is when the x-axis is zero. The y-intercept is the y-position, the up down position, when the x-axis is zero. That's still true for physics graphs and for physics labs. The y-intercept is still where the graph line is when the x-axis is zero, but now it tells us something about the physics of our experiments, about where things actually are, what's actually happening. Um, so if we say our y-intercept or our y-axis is position and our x-axis is time, the y-intercept should be the position when the ball, for the ball when the x-axis or time is zero. So if we take a look at the pivot video, this is how we were supposed to have things lined up with our ruler set next to where the ping pong ball is first visible. Remember, if we go back a frame, we can't see the ball anymore. If we go forward a frame past that, well, uh, there the ball is first visible. We have our time set to zero on this frame. So at zero seconds, the position should be pretty much zero. That's what we have for our initial data point. Um, if we just look at these things, that's not what we get. Our y-intercept is way up here because that's looking at when uh, the ping pong ball or after the ping pong ball hit the hit the can. If we look at the spot before the ping pong ball hit the can, and just that, um, looking at these things going there, and we'll turn these after spots off. So this part is after it hit the can. So if we ignore that right now, we have a certain slope to our line. We have a certain y-intercept. If we scroll down a little bit, our y-intercept would be 0 0.067 centimeters. 0 0.067 centimeters. Um, well, if it was 0 0.1 centimeters, that would be one millimeter, right? So this is less than a millimeter. That's a really tiny distance, right? So that little tiny distance is pretty much zero. We could do go one of a couple of ways. We could say it's small enough, uh, it's close enough to zero to say it's zero. We could say, hey, this could be, it should be maybe zero. We could also look at this and say, you know, that might be actually an indication of uh, how good I was at reading all of those data points. That, that little bit, that reason that it's not, that amount that it's away from zero, one-tenth uh, or six-tenths of a millimeter, that tiny little bit that it's off, might be due to some of the error associated with, and error not like mistakes, but the little wiggle room we have in making each measurement. Maybe if I move that first meter stick, if I moved it a smidge that way or a smidge this way, maybe it would have been exactly zero. If instead of saying 7.8, if I said 7.6, and if this was 23.3 instead of 23.5, if we all of those tiny little bits where we were trying to make measurements ourselves and read the tools, all those tiny little bits can have a little bit of an impact on how close this is to zero. So this is pretty stinking close to zero. Not exactly, but pretty stinking close. And in our cases, for what we're doing, we could say maybe it's an indication of some of the wiggle room in our data collection. Some people will say the error in our in our data. Uh, some people will say the uncertainty in our data. But that little bit of wiggle room is maybe why that's not exactly zero. And so now we have we had position is velocity times time plus our y-intercept. We just said that the position is velocity times time. We said that that y-intercept is where the object was at zero seconds. Now there are a bunch of different ways to say that or to write that down. So this next slide just looks at all the different ways people can write this down. But to be sure now, this y-intercept is the position of the object when time was zero. So now there are these variety of different ways to write this down. D equals VT plus DO. Some people would say this is D original or D at time zero. Different people will say it different ways. 
full tomato, tomato, potato, potato. Uh, some people would say instead of just saying this is D, some people might say it's final position and then original position. Some people might say, uh, like in math class, I use Y2, Y1, X2, X1. Some people might say it's position 2 and position 1. So they might say position 2 it is velocity times time plus position 1. Some people, instead of saying O for original and or one for position for that starting position. They might say I for initial, like the initial position. But all of them are saying the exact same thing. The position depends on how fast it's going, how long it's been going that fast, and where it started. It all makes sense. I mean, that, that just seeing it like that, it sounds like dirt. But now we have a way to kind of put it all into an equation. And that all comes from our data. So, uh, just kind of summarizing everything. Y equals mx plus b. Every straight line everywhere. Now, if we have a position time graph, if it's a straight line for a position time graph, instead of y equals mx plus b, y is position, m is velocity, or slope is velocity, our x-axis was time y-intercept is that initial position or that starting position, and this equation comes from our data. It's not just made up. It's not some bit of fiction. We collect our data, we plot it out, this is what we get. Now, it is true that physicists did choose to define velocity this way, but once it's defined that way from the data that we have and the graphs that we've got, now it just kind of goes. So velocity is defined as the slope of a position time graph. Uh, when we have more math under our belts, people will say that velocity is the derivative of a position time graph. Oh, 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 oh. Velocity is the derivative of a position time graph. It's like the fancy calculus way of saying velocity is the slope of a distance time graph. Okay, there you go. That's about it. Have a good one.